Well, if the setting looks a little different today, it's because I'm actually in Nigeria at the moment where we are conducting four back-to-back mass gospel crusades. We kicked off in Cape Town, South Africa a couple weeks ago. Then we came straight to Nigeria where we've conducted two of the four crusades here already. And so I'm right in the middle of that now. There's two more to go in this tour. And then we've got 50 of these crusades happening this year. So it's going to be a very busy and very exciting year. But you know, it's hard to express what a clash of worlds these two things are. You know, recording this podcast and then also conducting these crusades. Because, I mean, here I am refuting cessationism and all the while every night seeing tons of healings and miracles taking place. And in fact, if you'll stick around at the end of the podcast, I'll give you a little taste of what we have been experiencing this week. And so, you know, it really just makes this whole subject of cessationism seem so utterly silly. I feel like I'm trying to prove that the moon isn't made out of green cheese or something. Why am I wasting my time trying to disprove something so self-evidently and so obviously untrue? Anyway, I want to go in a new direction today. I actually thought last time about giving more attention to some of those Enlightenment philosophers and their anti-miracle arguments, the ones that I mentioned last time. And maybe I will do a podcast about that in the future. I think it would be very interesting. But I think that for the sake of this series on cessationism, it's really not necessary and actually probably somewhat of a digression. But I hope that I was able to accomplish my main goal in taking you on that journey through the historical development of modern cessationism. And hopefully you were, you were able to see how modern cessationism is really a product of the philosophy that emerged out of the Enlightenment, which itself had pagan origins, especially as it pertains to the anti-supernaturalism that was so popular at the time. And I just want to remind you that I showed you how Benjamin Warfield, who Remember, he was the godfather of modern cessationism. He essentially admitted that his cessationism polemic was not based on scripture, but on his critique of historical records using that enlightenment critical historical methodology, not the exegesis of scripture. And so as we saw, Warfield attacked and undermined reports of miracles from the first generation of the church after the apostles on to his own time, which was the 1800s. But in doing so, you have to realize this. He has essentially conceded my point, if you remember, which is that the church has not been historically cessationist, right? Because, I mean, you can't argue both that the church fathers were cessationist and then try to prove that all their claims of miracles and healings and the supernatural were false. Those two things don't go together. And so it's obvious that they were claiming miracles, whether those miracles were authentic or not, which means that they weren't cessationist, at least not in the way that the word is used today. And you know, this is even something that Edward Gibbon admits. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about Gibbon in the last podcast, but I didn't have time. But Gibbon was a prominent 18th century historian, and he wrote the book, the very famous book, by the way, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And It's kind of hard to say exactly what Gibbon was from reading his memoirs. I know that he was born into a Protestant family, then he converted to Catholicism, then back to Protestantism. And then it seems that he just lost his faith altogether. A lot of what he says sounds deist to me, but I don't know that he ever explicitly identified himself as a deist. But in any case, he was a skeptic, especially of religion in general and of miracles in particular. And by the way, remember that we talked about Conyers Middleton a few episodes ago? Remember, he was that Anglican cleric that wrote the book called Free Inquiry. And remember, he's the guy that John Wesley rebuked. He was the guy that had basically adopted the philosophy of the deists. And he's the guy, if you remember, that was one of Benjamin Warfield's main inspirations. Well, guess what? He also inspired Edward Gibbon and helped him in basically the deconstruction of his faith. And remember that I told you that Middleton and Warfield's arguments could be used against the Bible itself. Well, Gibbon is a great example of someone that did just that. Gibbon actually refers to Middleton as one of his great influences as he makes his argument against the miracles of the Bible. And so just think about this. The same guy that inspired Warfield, the cessationist godfather, 
inspired Gibbon, the skeptic historian who rejected all biblical miracles. And that's because all of this skepticism comes from the same source. And like I said before, if you reject all post-biblical miracles based on skeptical, rational arguments, then the only difference between you and someone that rejects all miracles completely, including biblical ones, is that they have a rationally consistent worldview and you don't. Anyway, even though Gibbon was a skeptic who rejected all miracles, as a historian, he had to admit that the church has claimed, in his words, an uninterrupted succession of miraculous powers. Let me just read you what he has to say here. He says, quote, The Christian church from the time of the apostles and their first disciples has claimed an uninterrupted succession of miraculous powers, the gift of tongues, a vision, and a prophecy, the power of expelling demons, of healing the sick, and of raising the dead. The knowledge of foreign languages was frequently communicated to the contemporaries of Irenaeus, though Irenaeus himself was left to struggle with the difficulties of a barbarous dialect whilst he preached the gospel to the natives of Gaul. The divine inspiration, whether it was conveyed in the form of a waking or a sleeping vision, is described as a favor very liberally bestowed on all ranks of the faithful, on women as on elders, on boys as well as upon bishops. When their devout minds were sufficiently prepared by a course of prayer, of fasting, and of vigils to receive the extraordinary impulse, they were transported out of their senses and delivered in ecstasy what was inspired, being mere organs of the Holy Spirit, just as a pipe or a flute is of him that blows into it. We may add that the design of these visions was, for the most part, either to disclose the future history or to guide the present administration of the church. The expulsion of demons from the bodies of those unhappy persons whom they had been permitted to torment was considered as a signal, the ordinary triumph of religion, and is repeatedly alleged by the ancient apologists as the most convincing evidence of the truth of Christianity. The awful ceremony was usually performed in a public manner, and in the presence of a great number of spectators, the patient was relieved by the power or skill of the exorcist, and the vanquished demon was heard to confess that he was one of the fabled gods of antiquity who had impiously usurped the adoration of mankind. But the miraculous cure of diseases, of the most inveterate or even preternatural kind, can no longer occasion any surprise when we recollect that in the days of Irenaeus, about the end of the second century, the resurrection of the dead was very far from being esteemed an uncommon event, that the miracle was frequently performed on necessary occasions by great fasting and the joint supplications of the church of the place, and that the persons thus restored to the prayers had lived afterwards among them many years, end quote. And so, again, let's just lay to rest once and for all this silly myth that the church fathers and the church in general was historically cessationist. That claim is not only anachronistic in the extreme, it is just plain wrong. And so here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to be giving you today a little taste of this unbroken chain of testimonies century by century. And of course, we already talked about many of the reports of miracles from the church fathers up until the time of Augustine in the fifth century. And again, there's really no question that reports abound up until this time. But today I'm going to give you some of the accounts from the 6th century up to the 14th. So that's covering a lot of territory in a short time. So I'll have to be quick and move fast here. And then in the next episode, I'm going to cover the 15th through the 19th centuries. And then, you know, the 20th century is just so crazy. I wouldn't even know where to begin without starting a whole new series. But trust me, this is going to be wild. And what I cover here is going to blow your mind. And so again, since we left off last time with Augustine in the 5th century, let's start in the 6th century now with Gregory the Great. Gregory was an early pope. He wrote a book called The Dialogues, which is literally a collection of visions and miracles and healings of the saints of the 6th century in Italy. And The Dialogues is one of the most fascinating pieces of literature from that period because it doesn't just tell stories of miracles and healings. It actually contains many firsthand testimonies of eyewitnesses to many of the miracles that it mentions. And, you know, some of the editions of this book are like 400 pages long. So there's so much we could talk about. But let me just give you a couple of examples here. One is of a bishop by the name of Fortunatus of Too Dirty. He was reported to have performed many miracles, including healing the sick, casting out devils. He was even reported to have raised a man from the dead. One of the interesting stories is about some Goths who had kidnapped two boys and 
Fortunatus sent a message to the Goths, basically pleading with them to return the children, even offering them money in exchange, but they refused. And so, as they're making their escape, as the story goes, one of the Goths' horses stumbles and falls on top of him, apparently shattering his thigh. And so this heathen Goth took this as a sign that the god of Fortunatus had cursed him. And so the Goth sends the kids back to the bishop, pleading for mercy and asking that Fortunatus would heal him. Now, I just want to point out that if this story is true, it's interesting to me that these heathen bandits had the thought, first, that their calamity was caused by the Christian God, and second, that Fortunatus had the power to heal them. Now, why would they have had that kind of reflex unless it was somehow known that such things were happening at the time? And so the story goes on to tell how Fortunatus sends his deacon to minister to the Goth after they returned the children. And here's what the account says, quote, all the rupture was so healed and himself so perfectly restored to his former health that he forsook his bed that very hour, took his horse and went on his journey as though he had never been hurt at all, end quote. Then around the same time, there's a guy known as Benedict of Nursia. According to the dialogues of Gregory, also experienced many miracles, even resurrections and healings. He was also very prophetic, operating in what we would probably describe as a word of knowledge, where he could tell about future events and even have very detailed information about things happening at the time in his absence, as though he had been there in person. For example, there's a story of a group of monks that had been traveling together to another town on official business. And apparently these guys weren't allowed to eat anything or drink anything outside of their monastery. Now, this might seem like a bit of a silly concern to us, but you have to realize these monks belonged to certain orders. They had taken vows before God and breaking those vows was serious. So again, these monks had taken vows to obey the rules of their abbey. One of those rules was they couldn't eat or drink anything outside the monastery. But now they're in another town. They're probably getting hungry and wondering if they can get away with bending the rules, whatever the situation. The story goes that they end up accepting the invitation of a certain lady to have a meal and refresh themselves at her house. I mean, what's the harm, right? But when they come back to the abbey, Benedict, who's in charge there, says, what have you guys been eating? And they all denied it. Who, us? We didn't, we didn't eat anything. But then Benedict told them that they were liars. They're a bunch of fibbing friars. And he went on to tell them exactly what they had done. It says that, quote, when they heard him recount so in particular, both where they had stayed, what kind of meat they had eaten and how often they had drunk and perceived well that he knew all whatsoever they had done. They fell down trembling at his feet and confessed that they had done wickedly, who straightways pardoned them for that fault, persuading himself that they would not anymore in his absence presume to do any such thing, seeing they now perceived that he was present with them in spirit, end quote. So now either Benedict had some pretty talented spies or this is an amazing example of a prophetic gift. Kind of reminds me of the story of Gehazi when Elijah said that his spirit went with him when he went to meet with Naaman, if you remember that story. So some pretty cool stuff. There's another famous story that you can actually find in some famous Italian paintings of an encounter that Benedict had with a king named Totila, who was the king of the Ostrogoths. Apparently, Benedict rebuked him for his wickedness. This is a king, remember, not just any ordinary guy. Benedict rebukes him for his wickedness and then told him future events, including when he would die. He said, quote, much wickedness do you daily commit and many great sins have you done. Now at length, give over your sinful life. Into the city of Rome shall you enter and over the sea shall you pass. Nine years shall you reign and in the 10th shall you leave this mortal life, end quote. And the account goes on to tell how King Totila repented and how the prophecy was exactly fulfilled. It says, quote, not long after he went to Rome, sailed over into Sicily, and in the 10th year of his reign, he lost his kingdom together with his life, end quote. There's another story that on one occasion, there was a group of monks that were building a wall when it collapsed on top of a little boy and crushed him to death. And the account in the dialogue says that the dead body was so mangled and the limbs were so pulverized that they put that little lifeless body into a sack to carry it around. It says, quote, for the stones of the wall had not only broken his limbs, 
but also his very bones being in that manner brought to the man of God, he bade them to lay him in his cell and in that place upon which he used to pray. And then putting them all forth, he shut the door and fell more instantly to his prayers than he used to at other times. And oh, strange miracle for the very same hour, he made him sound and as lively as ever he was before and send him again to his former work, end quote. And so there's lots more stories, tons of stories like this in the dialogues of Gregory, but let's move on. In the seventh century, we have guys like Attalus, who was reported to have resurrected a monk who'd been executed by the king, who was Ariowald the Arian. Apparently that monk had failed to salute the king or something as he passed by, which was the custom. There's another story where uh, Attalus saw that the pagans had taken a monk that was evangelizing in Tortuna, which is part of modern-day Sweden, and they drowned him in the river and piled, as the account says, a great heap of stones on him. And Italus raised him from the dead as well. Then, also in the 7th century, we have Cuthbert, who was a Northumbrian monk and bishop, who was reported to have seen many miracles and healings from reviving a dying boy to even creating a spring of water in dry soil. So that's a miracle of nature here. In the 8th century, we have guys like Rupert of Salzburg and Wolfrin and Boniface, who are just a few of the many that were reported to have experienced powerful miracles, healings, and even resurrections. Let me tell you a story about Wolfrin, who was the Bishop of Sens. Apparently, he was preaching in Frisia, and he was evangelizing the pagan Frisians. And look, you've got to imagine how wild it must have been in medieval Europe, Western Europe during this time. It was a serious mission field, probably unlike anything that exists in the world today. Many of those European tribes were idol-worshiping pagans of note. I'm talking about people that sacrificed their own children to the old gods. I'm talking about people that cannibalized one another. They were constantly kidnapping and murdering people from other clans and families. And these early Christian missionaries were bringing a message and a religion that had never been heard of yet in these places. It was all completely new. And you got to imagine it was probably weird to them and totally different from anything that they were used to. Christianity was like repulsive and laughable to these pagans that were used to gods like Thor and Odin. And, you know, pagan gods were proud and petty and mischievous. They were kind of like the super concentrated distillations of the values of the people that worshiped them. And of course, these were violent, bloodthirsty, immoral, greedy people. And so they worshiped gods that were also violent and bloodthirsty and immoral and greedy. And so now imagine that you worship a god like that, and then some goofy, friar tuck looking monk wearing a brown sack with a shaven head walks into your village holding a cross and preaching to you about some naked, crucified God that looks like weakness to you. And not only that, he's asking you to give up all of your traditional gods to worship only his. And we're talking about gods that your father and your great-grandfather and your great-great-grandfather had worshipped, going all the way back into the past as far as anyone's memory went. It was your whole culture. And back then, religion wasn't this you know, Sunday morning segregated part of your life. It was interwoven into every part of your primitive society. And so these missionaries represented a disruption to the entire social order. And they were foreigners. And they probably looked and sounded strange. And man, this was the wild, wild west. In many places, you could have killed somebody like this with zero repercussions. So needless to say, these early missionaries faced unbelievable danger every single day. And yet, somehow they managed to convert an entire continent to Christianity in a relatively short time period. It's actually kind of a miracle in itself. Now, secular historians would love you to believe that this was all just because of, you know, political alliances and other pragmatic reasons. But I'll tell you what, as a missionary evangelist myself, who has had many, many encounters with deep spiritual darkness in many unevangelized places in the world, I find it highly unlikely that this happened without some serious supernatural intervention. And it's actually one of the reasons that I'm inclined to believe 
that there is truth in many of these stories. Yeah, I'm sure that some of them are embellished. But, you know, often, even when we're talking about urban legends, there's some kernel of truth at the center of it from which the legend grew. And I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit was moving all throughout the Dark Ages in extraordinary ways through guys like this to bring these pagan tribes to their knees. And in that vein, let me just read you the account of Wolfram. It says, quote, St. Wolfram, Archbishop of Sens, entreated King Radbod to forbid the hanging of the young lad Avon as a sacrifice to the Frisian gods. When Avon, nevertheless, was hanged on a gibbet and strangled to death, Wolfram prayed to God to magnify his name before the idol worshipers and confound their false gods. After two hours of his prayers, the rope suddenly broke. Avon's body fell to the ground and Wolfram ran to the spot crying, Avon, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up. He did, and many Frisians were converted, end quote. Coming over into the ninth century now, we have Ansgar, who was a nobleman from France, who was known as the Apostle of the North. And he was also reported to have worked many miracles and had prophetic visions, even from a young age. And by the way, notice that he's called the Apostle of the North. Yes, as I've told you in the past, belief in the ongoing relevance of the apostolic calling and office is not some new thing like modern cessationists would have you to believe. Anyway, Ansgar's companion, Rimbert, wrote this about him, quote, It is impossible to count the number of those who were healed by his prayers and by his anointing. For, according to the statement made by many persons, sick people came eagerly to him, not only from his own diocese, but from a great distance, demanding from him healing medicine. He, however, preferred that this should be kept quiet rather than that it should be noised abroad. For when these signs of power were spoken of on one occasion in his presence, he said to a friend, were I worthy of such a favor from my God, would ask that he would grant to me this one miracle, that by his grace he would make of me a good man, end quote. Now, you'll notice that in a lot of those early miracle accounts, there's an almost over-the-top kind of humility where they're trying to make sure that they don't take any credit for any of the miracles that they experienced. And I think that's a good thing, and it's a good sign. Okay, now we're in the 10th century. We have guys like St. Maolus of Cluny. He was one of the ancient ancestors of George Clooney, who was a very humble monk, not George Clooney, St. Maolus of Clooney. And he was reported to have worked a vast number of miracles of healing in his travels. According to the life of Otto of Clooney, quote, he healed many who were sick, many who were blind, many bitten by serpents, by wolves or by dogs, many possessed by devils and rescued many from death by drowning or by fire, end quote. Okay, now as we're getting into the 10th century here, let me just pause to say that in all honesty, I will admit that it does seem like the reliable reports of genuine miracles are becoming fewer and fewer. Now, there's still plenty of stories circulating, so there's no way you could make the argument that they were cessationist. But on the other hand, a lot of times, the stories either include things that I would consider to be like superstitious, you know, relics, holy water, shrines, stuff like that, or they are sometimes second or third hand accounts, which are, of course, inherently less reliable. Or sometimes the stories themselves just are so outlandish that you hardly know what to think about them. Like, for example, stories of decapitated saints who picked up their own severed heads that continued to preach, stuff like that. So, again, in general, I would say that there does seem to be less that we could confidently say represents genuine miracles. And genuine examples of, you know, what the cessationists call sign gifts and revelatory gifts in operation in the church, at least in the surviving documentation that we have. But this, to me, is hardly proof of cessationism. Because, you know, if we see people or if we see a place or a time in history where people seem to be experiencing less of the gifts of the spirit, there are a lot of possible reasons that we could give for that. The conclusion that God has withdrawn these gifts from the church without any biblical support and in fact in opposition to what we read in scripture is the most extreme and the most unnecessary conclusion of all. I mean, imagine that I decide to take a power nap one afternoon, say 3 p.m. I set my alarm for 15 minutes, okay? But when I wake up, it's dark out. I look out the window and it looks like midnight. I'm, I'm totally confused. What in the world happened? Well, 
There's a few different possibilities, the most likely of which is that I fell into a deep sleep, slept through my alarm, or maybe I didn't set it properly or something like that. But imagine that I wake up, I see that it's dark outside, and my first reaction is, oh no, I guess the sun has collapsed into a black hole. (laughs) Now that's a pretty extreme conclusion to jump to, don't you think? But that's exactly what cessationists have done. They see that there are times and places in history where people haven't been experiencing miracles to some degree, and where that is the case, there are some very good possible explanations for why that might be. But they have jumped to the most extreme explanation, which is that, well, I guess the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. And my friend, that is an unnecessary, irrational, and actually quite dangerous conclusion to draw as a precedent. You could actually make the exact same argument about authentic salvations, couldn't you? Because, I mean, so much of what you read about coming from the church of this time sounds like hardly anyone's actually genuinely born again. Now, I'm sure there were people that were really saved, and I'm sure that there were people who really did experience authentic gifts of the Spirit. But it was a dark time. That's why we call it the Dark Ages. And there was a lot of corruption in the church. And there were a lot of things that were missing that needed to be restored. But that is not an argument for cessationism. That just means that you can have contexts in which there is so much error and so much sin and so much corruption that authentic Christianity is essentially missing. And by the way, isn't this the whole premise of the Reformation? Aren't we saying that something had been lost that needed to be recovered? Now, do these Reformed cessationists really want to lay in this Procrustean bed? I mean, think about it. Does the absence of the understanding of the truth of salvation by grace through faith mean that the truth had been abrogated or that the offering of salvation by grace through faith had been withdrawn or had ceased? You reform cessationists, don't you agree that such a logic would be flawed? Well, then I hope that you're not using that same flawed logic with regard to any of the gifts. So again, let me just drive this home for you. First of all, there were still miraculous gifts happening and operating all throughout the history of the church. I'm showing you that clearly. Second, not only were they operating, but the church believed that they were operating, so they were not cessationist. Third, even if we didn't have a single example of any authentic gifts in operation during that time, that would not be an argument for cessationism because there could be lots of other better and more biblical explanations. Fourth, if you think that the absence of the gifts would be a valid argument against their continuation, then you, to be consistent, would also need to accept that the absence of the teaching of the truth of salvation by grace through faith is an argument against the Reformation, right? But look, if there had not been a single example of gift of the Spirit operating since the last apostle died, that still would not be proof of cessationism because no amount of experience or lack of experience can trump the Word of God. And everything that the Bible says about the gift of the Spirit, it says assuming that they are ongoing and relevant. Now, on the flip side, if there were even a single solitary example of an authentic gift of healing or of miracles or prophecy or tongues over the last 2,000 years since the last apostle died, that would disprove cessationism. Because, again, if God did it even once over the last 2,000 years, it means that the gifts didn't cease, right? I mean, look, the dodo bird is extinct, right? That means they've all ceased to exist. But say on the news tomorrow, you hear that a single dodo bird has been discovered. That would mean they are not extinct, right? If even one exists, then they haven't ceased. And so to be a cessationist, you've got to believe that God has never once in the last 2,000 years decided to speak to anyone prophetically or give anyone gifts of healings or miracles or tongues or anything like that. And my friend, look, in light of the profusion of the historical evidence to the contrary, not to mention the total absence of any biblical evidence, that seems like an impossible position to defend. Even in these more dry seasons of the church, like we're discussing now. But interestingly, over the next several hundred years, we start to see these little revival movements, for lack of a better term, popping up in different places. 
And often these are happening in the form of religious orders like the Franciscans or the Dominicans or the Cistercians. And these people realized, as we do, that something was missing. And so these orders were pushing back against this cold, religious, strictly intellectual kind of Christianity that had led to the dead, dry versions that they were experiencing. And these orders began to promote the experiential side of Christianity. These people wanted to know God, not just know about religion. And so when we come over into the 11th century now, which is a really interesting time, right? This is when the Great Schism took place in 1054, where, you know, the churches in the East and the West split from each other, forming the Orthodox Church in the East and the Roman Catholic Church in the West. And this is probably the darkest time for the church and for the world. And yet, even in the darkest darkness of the Dark Ages, we still have reports of miracles like crazy. For example, Edward the Confessor, the English king, who was famous for his humility and devotion and holiness. In the Annals of Roger of Havendin, written in the 12th century, it has the stories of several miracles that took place during his life. For example, it tells us that one time he was on his way to church to worship, and there was a leper sitting on the side of the road that asked for help. So the king picked up the leper, put him on his own shoulders and prayed for him. And according to the account, the leper was made whole. One time during mass, Edward said that he had a vision, an open-eyed vision, where he saw the Danes, you know, the Vikings, heading to attack England. And as they got closer, the Danish king fell into the water. The ship was destroyed. And apparently as he was seeing this vision, he was smiling. And when the priests asked why he was smiling, he told them what he was seeing. And he told everyone to note the day and the hour in which he had the vision. And it turned out, they found out later, everything that he saw was exactly true and it was happening at the very same hour when Edward saw it in the vision. Then we have Bernard of Clairvaux, who was a French abbot, who's been credited with many well-documented and widely attested miracles. Some of them happened to well-known people. Many of them happened in front of large crowds as he was ministering. Apparently he had chroniclers who traveled with him and recorded many of the miracles that took place in one city, Nine blind people and 10 deaf mutes were healed along with 18 lame or paralyzed people. The next Wednesday, even more miracles happened. The Journal of Bernard's Exploits at Constance contains 53 miracle records in itself. Albie J. Luddy, who wrote The Life and Teachings of St. Bernard, said of Bernard, quote, the miracles are so well substantiated that to doubt them would mean to discredit all history, end quote. The Cardinal Robert Bellamine, who was himself canonized as a saint, said, quote, Bernard has more miracles to his credit than any other saint whose life has been written, end quote. Now, let's keep moving on to the 13th century. This was the time of Francis of Assisi. I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about Francis, but you know, he had a pretty interesting life. And if you know anything about his story, you know that one of the most defining moments in his life is when he heard what was apparently an audible voice say, Francis, rebuild my church according to the life of St. Francis by Thomas of Salino. Francis had prophetic and revelatory gifts and graces of miraculous power. And there are numerous reports of cleansing lepers and casting out demons and healing the sick and even healings manifested by him touching objects like what we see in Acts 19. Also in the 13th century, we have Claire of Montefalco, who was said to have had visions, prophecies, and words of knowledge often even knowing the thoughts of the sisters in her community. Now, again, I'm sure that some of the accounts from this time period have been exaggerated or misunderstood. It's not my position that all of these miracle claims are completely accurate. Uh, now, I do think, however, that there are many reliable and accurate accounts among them from trustworthy witnesses. But here's the thing. What these reports clearly and undeniably show is that Christians of this time, as well as those that came before and after, believed in the continuation of the miraculous gifts, signs, wonders, and healings. And again, this is in direct contradiction to those that claim that cessationism is the undisputed historical doctrinal position of the church, which is an impossible position to defend. I mean, here we are now, 1,300 years past the time of Christ, 
and we're still seeing tons of reports of miracles. And in fact, they seem to be increasing as we go along. And this is something that Benjamin Warfield himself admits in Counterfeit Miracles. Look what he says, quote, instead of a regularly progressing decrease, there was a steadily growing increase of miracle working from the beginning on. This is doubtless the meaning of the inability of certain of the scholars whom we have quoted after having allowed that the apostolic miracles continued f- through the first three centuries to stop there. There is a much greater abundance and precision of evidence, such as it is, for miracles in the fourth and succeeding centuries than for the preceding ones. In other words, Warfield is saying here that the testimonies of miracles increase as we go through church history and If you allow for any miracles to continue beyond the apostles, including in the first three centuries, there is no way to argue consistently that they've ceased at any point thereafter. And in fact, Warfield is saying there is more evidence for miracles in the fourth centuries and beyond than there is for those in the first three. Which is why Warfield was so adamant in insisting that absolutely none of the miracles that we read about after the apostles' generation including in the church fathers, none of them could be considered genuine because he knew that if you allow any miracles beyond the time of the apostles, cessationism's historical argument is toast. Look at what he says, citing Middleton for support, by the way. Quote, there is no reason for allowing miracles for the first three centuries, which is not as good or better for allowing them for the succeeding centuries. End quote. He continues, quote, the genuineness of the ecclesiastical miracles being once allowed No stopping place can be found until the whole series of alleged miracles down to our own day be admitted, end quote. So you see, this is a full-blown admission of what I've been telling you over and over. Modern cessationism is motivated. If they allow any post-biblical miracles, then they can never prove cessationism. Now, when we come over into the 14th century, this is when the Renaissance began. And we talked a little bit about the time of the Renaissance a couple of episodes ago, but this is really the beginning of a whole new era in the church and in the world. And of course, the Renaissance also had a profound effect on the way that people began to think about the supernatural. The Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy says, quote, the unashamedly humanistic flavor of classical writings had a tremendous impact on Renaissance scholars. Here, one felt no weight of the supernatural pressing upon the human mind, demanding homage and allegiance. Humanity, with all its distinct capacities, talents, worries, problems, possibilities, was the center of interest. It has been said that medieval thinkers philosophized on their knees, but bolstered by their new studies, they dared to stand up and rise to full stature, end quote. And yet, even in this new climate of classical learning and innovation and really cultural transformation, we continue to see men and women of God experiencing miracles and operating in the gifts of the Spirit. For example, Vincent Ferrer was a Dominican friar and a missionary and logician, by the way, who was also known for speaking in tongues. Although he was French, he had only learned a little bit of Latin and Hebrew, and it was said that he was able to speak fluently with Germans, Greeks, Sardinians, Hungarians, and Italians, all by the power of the Spirit. And, in fact, as we come over into the 15th and 16th centuries now, we see this very interesting explosion of reports of people experiencing things like tongues. For example, Louis Bertrand, along with two other brothers, went to New Grenada as missionaries. When he arrived, he found that it would be nearly impossible to communicate with the locals since they spoke so many different dialects. And so Louis prayed for the gift of tongues and was able to preach supernaturally to the local people in their dialects. Jean of the Cross experienced this same phenomenon with Arabic. He led two Muslims to faith by speaking to them in their language, which he had never learned. And he was said to have spoken in tongues frequently. Francis Xavier, the first missionary to Japan, also spoke in tongues supernaturally. It says, quote, he spoke freely, flowingly, elegantly, as if he had lived in Japan all his life, end quote. Louis Bertrand is also said to have spoken in large gatherings to people from many different countries and Everyone in attendance heard his sermon in their own languages simultaneously. The same thing was said to have happened to Anthony of Padua. And although their doctrine was far from perfect, the Catheri were also reported to have spoken in tongues frequently, along with many other supernatural phenomena. 
Dominic of Ozma was known to evangelize in languages he had never learned on a couple of occasions. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi spoke in Latin without ever having learned it. Christine Mirabilis, also known as Christine the Admirable, sang in Latin, which she had never learned. Sisters from the convent of Humiliane Circe said they would hear glossolalia-like songs coming from her. We also read during this time about believers having these overwhelming experiences in prayer and in worship where they talk about how their hearts overflowed in a way that couldn't be expressed with natural words. Sometimes they express themselves with outbursts of wordless songs or inarticulate sounds or sometimes expressive dances and even outbursts of laughter. And there is a rich tradition of these experiences going all the way back to the early church fathers, including men like Hilary, Augustine, John Cassian, Ambrose of Milan, Peter Christologus, John Christostom, Gregory the Great, Isidore of Seville, and many, many others that either experienced themselves or spoke approvingly of what is commonly referred to as jubilation. The Catholic theologian Eddie Ensley says, quote, in certain passages in Franciscan literature, we find the sounds of certain jubilations actually written out. These descriptions are amazingly like descriptions of present-day glossolalia within the charismatic renewal, end quote. The 19th century scholar Albert Fargus said, quote, there are even more violent transports such as those so often observed in St. Francis of Assisi, St. Philip Neri, St. Joseph of Cupertino, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, whose jubilation or spiritual inebriation showed itself outwardly in actions which astonished and even scandalized the weak and ignorant. Such were their sighs, cries, ardent and broken exclamations, abundant tears and even laughter, songs, improvised hymns, tremors agitating every limb, leapings, impetuous movements, the violent outward expressions of enthusiasm and love. Thomas Aquinas commenting on a gloss in the text of Psalm 46 that read, quote, jubilation is an ineffable joy which cannot be kept silent but cannot be expressed because it exceeds comprehension. And Aquinas' comment then read, quote, such is the goodness of God which cannot be expressed and if it is expressed, it would be done so imperfectly, end quote. The biographer of Jacopone de Todi says that, quote, he babbled of love with tears and laughter, sorrow and delight, and with gestures that seemed foolish to other men, end quote. In his poem that's called On Jubilations of the Heart That Breaks Forth in the Voice, we find lines like these, quote, his tongue in childish stammering shakes, nor knows he what his lips may say. And his neighbors stand apart and mock the senseless chatter. They deem his speech a foolish blur, end quote. Others referred to these phenomena with other terms like inebriation or intoxication. For example, Alphonsus Liguri said, quote, spiritual intoxication causes the soul to break forth in, as it were, delirium, such as songs, cries, immoderate weeping, leaping, etc., end quote. Bernard of Clairvaux said, quote, during this assault of love, the soul cannot contain itself, and to alleviate the heart, it breaks forth into expressions of love, which are without order, rule, or human rhetoric. It often happens also that the soul is mute and can merely give expressions to sighs, end quote. Now, as we continue through the coming centuries, you'll notice that the same phenomena are mentioned again and again, but all kinds of different terms are used. For example, Charles Finney will talk about unutterable gushings. Teresa of Avila talks about a strange and mysterious kind of prayer. The Camisards will burst out with exhortations in languages they never learned. In the first and second great awakenings, we read about ecstatic experiences. Sometimes they will connect those utterances with tongues explicitly. For example, in the case of the Anabaptists and Irvingites. But other times they understood those experiences within the context of their own frame of reference. And they use their own kinds of language. And this shouldn't be hard to understand because, look, again, in a similar way, we don't read about people becoming born again in these ancient sources. And that's not because these experiences aren't happening. It's just because they used different terminology. And so from this point forward, what we see is that the reliable accounts of supernatural phenomena in the church increase dramatically. And of course, 
in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation takes place. And as truth is being restored, together with authentic expressions of biblical Christianity, it seems like the gifts of the Spirit just proliferate. And this is especially astonishing, given the fact that, as I showed you in a previous episode, Calvin actually used cessationism as a way to combat the Catholic Church, which is why, even to this day, the most staunchly cessationist groups tend to be Calvinist. And yet, the gospel truth that was restored in the Reformation opened the floodgates of Holy Spirit power to be unleashed on the world again. And so, rather than the Reformation basically making the miraculous gifts a thing of the past, as you'd expect, it actually became the catalyst for a whole new era of Holy Spirit activity. Because, you know, as Reinhard Bonnke used to say, if you bury a lie, it will rot. But if you bury the truth, it will rise. And that's why Jesus rose from the dead. And I'll tell you what, you can bury the gifts of the Spirit under an avalanche of bad theology and terrible logic and lies about history and gross unbelief. But you can be sure of this, they're not going anywhere. While the critics are sitting in their stuffy little classrooms telling each other that these things don't happen anymore, God will raise up men and women who will believe his word and trust him, and they'll see miracles and they'll do the impossible because they believed. And so I think we've probably got one more episode in the series where we're going to continue with the history of the moving of the Spirit. And I'm telling you right now, this is going to be the most exciting one yet. So don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast. And before it's over, I want to show you a little bit of what we're experiencing here in Nigeria. I look forward to seeing you next time right here on Daniel Kalenda Off the Record. Are you happy people of Hava? When you call upon the name of Jesus, his hand will sweep under you. He will catch you where you fall and he will lift you up out of sin. He will lift you up out of darkness. He will lift you out of addiction. He will lift you out of adultery. He will lift you out of idolatry. He will lift you out of chains. He will lift you out of hell. And he will lift you higher and higher all the way to heaven. If you believe it, shout amen. He healed you. What did he heal you from? My eye. Can we test your eye to make sure that Jesus has healed you? How many fingers am I holding up? Two. Hallelujah! Oh, glory to Jesus! It was so painful. I couldn't open my mouth. Even to smile, I was just smiling one-sided, but now I can smile. Oh, isn't Jesus wonderful? You're going to meet Jesus. He's going to change you. He's going to wash you. He's going to cleanse you. Because from this night forward, your body will become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! He healed me. He was in a coma and having seizures. And he could not walk or jump. But we prayed in the name of Jesus! Do you know who has healed you, Richard? Jesus. What's his name, Richard? Jesus! He doesn't come here to be part of your life. Oh no, he comes to be the Lord of your life. When we finished praying, I jumped and my leg was ever, my leg was no more stiff and I could run again. Hallelujah, King, let's run it. Jesus died upon that cross to save you from sin, to save you from death, to save you from addiction to save you from darkness, to save you from bondage. And when you call upon his name, Jesus Christ will set you free. When you go home tonight, you will be a shining light for Jesus. I had a breastfed, so now I can, <laughs> I, I can't even jump. Maybe that's, that's... Come on, show us what you can do now. No pain. Hallelujah! I bless you in the name of Jesus. If you receive it, shout a mighty amen!